I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. In the early 1500s, the lands of Central Europe comprised the Holy Roman Empire. Its people were expected to be loyal to both emperor and pope. Rulers were expected to defend both the empire and the Roman Catholic Church. The accepted belief was that God himself had established this twofold authority over the Christian civilization. They recognized the emperor as ruler of life on earth, and the church as the means for salvation in the world to come. But the church had come to emphasize God's judgments much more than his mercy. Even Jesus was presented as a relentless avenger, and men and women were seen so hopelessly engulfed in sin that they must live in a perpetual dread of an angry God. Painted constantly and vividly were the fires and torments of hell. It was a time of deep-rooted superstition and fear. Christianity was mixed with elements of paganism, and it was a world thought to be filled with demons and evil spirits. For protection and deliverance from eternal damnation, the church demanded absolute and unquestioning obedience from the people. On a summer day in 1505, a little over a decade after Columbus discovered the New World, a young law student made his way through the marketplace in Erfurt, Germany. His name was Martin Luther. Martin Luther was on his way to this Augustinian monastery in Erfurt, Germany. He little expected that from here he would move to center stage in human history. Luther became a flashpoint that gathered up forces for change that had been building for over a hundred years. And he caused an upheaval across Europe that forever changed the face of Christianity. It made for one of the most dramatic turning points in history. But Luther had no intentions of changing the world. All he wanted was to save his own troubled soul. He wanted only to withdraw behind these walls to live the quiet life of a monk. Are you prepared, my son, to follow the rules of the Augustinian order? to die to the self, the world, the flesh, to renounce family and friends, to suffer poverty, to mortify your body, to be obedient to your superiors in all things? With the help of God, I am, insofar as human frailty permits. Pax tecum. Et cum spiritu tua. Now a friar in the Augustinian order of hermits, Brother Martin was bound by vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. Strict adherence to monastic practice, endless acts of penance to God, the angry judge, failed to bring peace to Martin Luther's troubled soul. Father, your pardon. If it were merely fear of God, I could still hope for his mercy. But this I shall never have. And why not? My sins, Father. Brother Martin, you have just come from the Mass, the sacrifice for all sins you have confessed. Or am I wrong? Is there anything more? Much more. Then make your confession. Yes, I 
Father, for I have sinned, and my sin is unpardonable. That is for God to judge, not you, my son. He has judged me already. He is God. He is holy. I am man. I am evil. And for this, he condemns me. I've tried to think of him as a loving father, but can find only an angry judge. No matter what I do to seek him out, he condemns me. How can I love such a God? But you do. You must love God. Father, I cannot. And this is my unpardonable sin. I cannot. Father. Luther was sent by his superiors on a visit to Rome. They thought that perhaps there in the center of Christendom, Luther might finally find some relief for his tortured conscience. While in Rome, Luther sought his peace in the traditional devotions of the church. But his doubts did not go away. They only deepened. After Luther returned home to Germany, he was assigned to take up duties in Wittenberg. There, Luther was a parish priest, a teacher, and a professor at the new university at Wittenberg. Luther fervently continued his search for God's grace in prayer and in the study of the scriptures. Month after month, as he pored over the pages of the Bible, he began to find that assurance his heart and mind so desperately craved. When all this sudden doubt? This is no sudden doubt, but a growing certainty. Dear Vicar, what little certainty I have you gave to me. You heard my sin. You sent me to Rome to fortify my faith. You sent me to Scripture to find my God. You brought me here to Wittenberg to preach his word. And here in my room, I've been preparing my lectures on the Epistle of St. Paul to the Romans. And here, I think I've found the truth at last. And when I found it, it was as though the gates of heaven were open to me. Romans 1.17. Justitia enim Dei. Justitia enim Dei, for the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so? Worthy vicar, do we find anything here of relics? By faith man lives and is made righteous, not by what he does for himself. Be it adoration of relics, singing of masses, pilgrimages to Rome, purchase of pardon for his sins, but by faith in what God has done for him already through his son. Dr. Martin, if you leave the Christian to live only by faith, if you sweep away all good works, all these glorious things you dismiss as mere crutches, what will you put in their place? Christ. Man only needs Jesus Christ. The just should live by faith. Alone. A turning point for Luther came when Dominican friar John Tetzel began promoting indulgences nearby. Indulgences that offered forgiveness and raised money for Rome. Now, my good people, this is no ordinary indulgence. This will build St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. And you will share in every mass that is said from now till doomsday. Here, in the Pope's own Latin, plenaria. Remissio, omnium peccatorum. What does that mean? Full forgiveness for all sins. Absolution from all punishments. No confession necessary. Valid even for your loved ones in purgatory. 
For who would see his mother in flames when with a piece of silver he can set her free? For as soon as the money clinks in the chest, a soul flies up to heavenly rest. Come along, good people. Come. Follow them. Luther heard about what Tetzel was doing and went to his pulpit to oppose him. Our Lord Jesus Christ, by coming on earth, by suffering and dying, has already paid for our salvation forever. How then can any mortal man, monk, prince, or pope extort a further payment? My beloved, you cannot buy God's mercy. Amen. This is the castle church at Wittenberg where Luther taught and preached. On the door is an inscription of Luther's 95 theses. These were his arguments against what he considered to be the intolerable scandal of indulgences that is, the selling of forgiveness and salvation. Luther's associate, Philip Melanchthon, said that he nailed his theses to the door here. More recent historians say that they were probably sent by mail to the intended audience of scholars. But whether they were mailed or nailed, we know this. They set off an explosion. Within weeks, they were the talk of all Germany. And within months, all Christendom was buzzing over the challenge posed by this obscure German monk. This would eventually lead to a historic encounter at Leipzig where Luther debated the noted theologian, John Eck. Out of reverence for the Supreme Pontiff and the Roman Church, I would have preferred to take no part in the discussion which cannot but lead to disunity within the ranks of the faithful. But out of respect for the truth, I repeat, it was not upon St. Peter that Christ founded the church, but upon himself. But my dear doctor, many authorities disagree with you. Caplectus, Scotus, Peter Lombard, for instance. Hmm, to say nothing of Cyprian and Nazianzus, yes, doctor, they do. But my authority disagrees with all of them. And who is that authority? St. Paul. For no other foundation can man lay than that which is laid, even Jesus Christ. But, Doctor, these attacks upon the Pope cannot help but bring disunity upon the Church. That is not my intention. But the effect is the same as if it were. In fact, it is common knowledge that your doctrines are approved by those who have already split the Church. Name them. The followers of us. The Hussites are wrong. But I confess, I find much that is acceptable to Christ among their doctrines. Such as? Such as this. There is only one universal church. Or this. It is not necessary for salvation to be subject to a Roman pope. What, Doctor? That is the heart of the heresy. That is exactly what has said. It doesn't matter who said it, it is the truth. Martin Luther. Do you think you are the only one who knows the truth? I will tell you what I think. I have the right to believe freely, to be a slave to no man's authority, to confess what appears to me to be true, whether it is proved or disapproved, whether it is spoken by Catholic or by heretic. Then you deny the authority of the Pope. In matters of faith, I think that neither council nor pope nor any man has power over my conscience. And where they disagree with scripture, I deny pope and council and all. A simple layman armed with scripture is greater than the mightiest pope without it. Heresy, Dr. Luther. Heresy! Heresy! So be it. It is still the truth. Luther's reputation spread rapidly. To some, he was the hero who would finally stand up to Rome. 
To others, he was a danger that had to be removed. Luther's writings became even more bold. The Pope could no longer ignore the threat that he posed. The time to keep silent has passed, and the time to speak has come. The nobility of our land must set itself against the Pope as a common enemy and destroyer. We have the name of empire, but the Pope is all that is ours. Let him give us back our liberty, honor, body and soul. And that, Your Holiness, is mild compared with this. Freedom from the tyranny of Rome. Every man his own priest before God. Now we shall do some writing. Draw up a condemnation of this man. We shall see how his faith stands up against a papal decree. Your Holiness, we presume to prepare a draft. Exerge Domine. Arise, O Lord, and judge thy cause. A wild boar invades thy vineyard. Arise, O Peter. Arise, O Paul. Arise, ye saints. Arise, thou church universal. We can no longer suffer this serpent to creep through the fields of the Lord. The books of Martin Luther containing his errors are to be sought out and burned by the Inquisitor. As for Martin Luther himself, dear God, what office of paternal love have we omitted to recall him from his errors? Now, therefore, we give him 60 days to retract his writing. Failing such retraction, he shall stand under our anathema and excommunication. And be it hereby finally known that whatsoever person shall aid or help the said Martin Luther, that person shall be subject with him to our excommunication and anathema, and will stand together with him under the wrath of Almighty God and the apostles Peter and Paul. Signed Leo and sealed with the Pope's own seal. Sixty days. When are they up? Tomorrow. <laughs> Wittenberg, the night of December tenth, fifteen twenty. Rome. Because you have destroyed the truth of God, let God destroy you in these flames. The blaze that Luther kindled was more than a religious crisis. The political stability of the Holy Roman Empire was at stake. The Emperor, Charles V, convened the Diet of Worms in the spring of 1521. Luther was summoned to appear. Yesterday you admitted these writings were yours. Will you tell us now, do you persist in what you have written here, or are you prepared to retract these writings and the beliefs they contain? I ask pardon if I lack the manners that befit this court. I was not brought up in king's palaces, but in the seclusion of a cloister. I'm asked to retract these writings, but they are of different kinds. In some I discuss faith and good works. If I were to retract these, I should be denying accepted Christian truths. In others, I attack popery and assail men who have afflicted the Christian world and ruined the bodies and souls of other men. If I were to retract those, I should be like a cloak that covers evil. Most serene emperor, illustrious princes, noble lords, I am only a man and not God. 
But I must defend myself as did Jesus Christ when he said, as I say now, if I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. Martin Luther, you have not yet answered the question. Give us a simple answer. Will you recant or will you not? You ask for a simple answer. Here it is. Unless you can convince me by scripture and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the text of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. Who is this monk to go against the church and against me? I should have seized him right then and there and had him. Yet he was under my safe conduct. I could not go back on my word. Your illustrious majesty, may I say that not even an emperor need keep his oath to a heretic. Twenty-one days we give him. After that, his book shall be wiped from the memory of man. His followers, whoever they may be, shall be condemned. And this Luther himself, he shall be under our curse. No man shall harbor him, no man protect him. I declare him hereby outlaw, free to be hunted, free to be seized by anyone, anywhere. Then to be done to death at will. Now condemned by both Pope and Emperor, Luther was captured on his way back to Wittenberg. He was taken here to the Wartburg Castle. But it had all been arranged by a friend, Duke Frederick, to keep Luther safe and hidden. Luther stayed here for 10 months. Here he completed his magnificent translation of the New Testament into German. Meanwhile, back at Wittenberg, Luther's colleagues worked in his absence to carry on his reforms. In their enthusiasm, they went far beyond anything Luther wanted or expected. Luther came out of hiding and returned to his pulpit. Our Lord Jesus Christ is betrayed by what you have done here. How dare you destroy? When will you learn that even faith in itself is not enough without love? When will you understand that we must win brothers and sisters from the other side with love and not with force? You have laid hands upon the crucifix. How dare you defile something that might help a man with his devotions. What about your faith? What about your love? I tell you, the fruit of the gospel is not only righteousness, it is love. Christian, here is how I must use my freedom. I must give myself to my neighbor. 
as Jesus Christ in love gave himself to me. I must do nothing in life that is not needful to my neighbor, because through faith I have all that I need myself. In this way, and in this way only, can I become a true son of a gracious God. Under Duke Frederick's protection, Luther settled down again in Wittenberg. He married a former nun, Catherine von Bora. They lived here in what was previously a monastery. They had six children, so now we have Luther, the former celibate monk, now exalting marriage, saying, there is no bond on earth so sweet, nor any separation so bitter as that which occurs in a good marriage. Look at the size of this home. Here the Luthers would take in 30 students and guests at a time. Here Luther's Reformation teachings were tested, expounded, and then sent forth. It's important to emphasize that Luther never intended to start a new church, nor to break with Rome, but the various attempts to work out the differences failed. Luther's followers developed into a separate denomination. Today, there are over 58 million baptized Lutherans around the world. Fifteen countries have over a half a million Lutheran members.